Yes, we are hosting the um, 31st Blockchain Hub Graz Meetup. It's been quite a lot. <laughs> so um, the last time uh, Block42 has been hosting us and today Confinity is, is hosting this. So just to give you some basics, drinks are on us in the fridge over there. So there's where the cold drinks are. Um, if you find time to take out uh, a beer, put one back in so we have constantly rotating cold and warm drinks for everybody. <laughs> okay, uh, the, <laughs> the lowest fridge compartment uh, is uh, for drinks without alcohol. Yes, um, if somebody needs um, Wi-Fi, that's the Wi-Fi name and the password. Over there are the toilets. Yeah, and now some words. Um, what is Confinity for those of you who don't know us yet? This is, isn't going to be a marketing presentation, just a couple of slides. So we started in 2014 <coughs> with a Bitcoin ATM. This actually was the first machine. Now we're running around 50 machines all over Austria. Um, we then started in 2015 our product Bitcoin Born, which is a voucher product, which you can buy in over 4,000 outlets in Austria. And if somebody is interested, I have a couple of uh, giveaway cards worth 5 euros, so you can test the product. Uh, talk to me later if you want to have one. Um, this is how it looks like. Also in 2015 we launched our retail platform. It's just a basic platform where you can buy and sell cryptocurrencies uh, on, our, on our website. In 2016 we launched a product uh, called Bitcoin Wertschrift, which we don't sell anymore because we have a version 2, but this is the, uh, the first one, the, uh, the ancestor of our, our following product. This looks like this. This basically is a paper wallet that we <coughs> generate for the non-technical customer um, there's a notary presence uh, looking that we don't know the private keys as Confinity, so this has been a very uh, labor-intensive manual product. And in 2018, we made a follow-up product, which is called the Card Wallet. This is a cooperation with the Österreichische Staatsdruckerei, the Austrian State Printing House. And beside the name, it's not a um, state-held company, it's a, it's a private company, because many people uh, talked to us and said, oh, you, you are cooperating with, with the uh, Austrian state and um, we, we don't want to be um, followed by the Austrian state. No, it's a normal, um, publicly owned, um, privately owned um, printing house. This is the actual product. Uh, this should make it very easy for someone who wants to hold Bitcoin or, or Ethereum. It's the, the public, public key on the front side and on the back side is a sealed private key with a very high secure seed. Yeah, and also we tried to enter the Lightning Network. Uh, Daniel over here adapted our Bitcoin ATM so that we actually made the first Lightning transaction on a Bitcoin ATM worldwide, which we are uh, kind of proud. Yeah, and the last step is um, what we are currently working on. It's called our Crypto Services Suite. Working title, I'm not sure about this yet because uh, the approbation is CSS and this is, yeah, this is already, uh, already um, gone. But what it is, it's, it's basically, it's a robust API for B2B partners who want to launch uh, products in the crypto space. So if you want to, if you have a good business idea in the crypto space and you want to do something but you don't want to run the whole technical infrastructure in the background, running the full nodes, monitor transactions, uh, do trading, stuff like this, you can talk to us because uh, we want to solve these uh, problems for you. So what we are currently doing, we are shifting from a retail a B2C um, a company to a B2B provider. So we are providing services for other companies wanting to get active in the crypto space. Okay. Uh, and also we have a couple of jobs available, so if you are a developer or have any other um, skills uh, you think would be good for our company, please have a look at our website, confinity.co.jobs. Yeah, I think that's it for the intro. Thomas, please okay. go ahead. Can I go ahead? Uh, so who has not been to a blockchain hub meetup yet? Oh. Quite a lot. Quite a lot. Quite a lot. So just just a couple of words uh, for the blockchain hub. So the hmm? no, that's just talking. Okay. Um, 
So the blockchain hub class was, was uh, started in 2016 and uh, together with Brussels and, uh, and Berlin. And uh, during that time, uh, basically, uh, it was a very slow moving pace. So we were at 10 euros per ether and I don't know the Bitcoin price at that time, something like 300 or, or something like that, 400. Uh, so, and nothing much happened 16. So, I was, uh, I was uh, stumbling over Ethereum at that time, uh, at a Bitcoin meetup here in Graz, and uh, I was thrown into the space. So I contacted uh, Sherwin Washinger, I, I don't know if you know her, she's leading the Crypto Economics Institute in, in Vienna. Uh, and contacted her, she was in, in Berlin at that time, and so we founded this kind of three cities network of blockchain hub, and the intention was to grow that bigger and bigger. Um, of course, 2017, a lot of things changed, so basically everybody was talking about crypto, everybody wanted to buy some, some bitcoins or bought some bitcoins, uh, hopefully not till the end, because then they lost also some uh, kind of money during that, uh, uh, after that craziness. Um, and basically in 16, um, we had this kind of calm progress on it. So uh, we started around the blockchain hub kind of meetups. We started, for example, the blockchain startup contest together with Max. Uh, we, we, we organized the contest and just to give you the scale what we were talking uh, about at that time, uh, I was uh, subscribed to 80 Facebook blockchain uh, groups. These were all blockchain groups on Facebook at that time. And I was subscribed to 40 IoT blockchain, uh, IoT groups on uh, Facebook. And these were basically all IoT groups on Facebook. And then I was advertising our blockchain startup contest at that time. Um, and uh, we had 80 applications from five <coughs> continents, uh, from 29 countries at that time. And basically that was a big portion of the kind of startup uh, in 2016. And uh, the winners uh, were uh, Etherisk, probably known to some of you, uh, insurance on the Ethereum blockchain. They provided some automated insurance contracts on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, during the DEFCON uh, at that time and the other one was Status and Status is maybe also known to some of you uh, Status is working on a chat client which uh, works similar to WeChat um, and uh, those two they were the major winners then there were three other prizes but Status just half a year later collected something like 150 million in the ICO craziness and they got 5,000 Euro, uh, 5, euros prize money when they were participating in, in our blockchain startup contest. <coughs> so well, everything changed actually in 2017. Uh, fast forwards, uh, the uh, blockchain hub uh, as it is, so the, the regular meetups as we do it here uh, doesn't exist anymore anywhere else anymore, so we just kept the name, we keep up the, the meetups, I think it's a good kind of way of uniting uh, different kind of interests in the blockchain space and therefore we just maintain the uh, regular meetups and, uh, and the web page is of course still online but basically we are the ones which are still active. So we need a couple more people that we have the 600 <coughs> subscribers on the meetup page, so if you know somebody, please get them to subscribe and I hope we can somewhere jump uh, to the first place in the numbers of subscribers for the meetup. So uh, we are close, we are always just close behind JavaScript. <laughs> and um, so I think we will just continue in that way. So to have the blockchain hub meetups here so that from different kind of groups uh, people can come together and we tried in the summer this kind of format the first time, um, so to have just rather short talks, but several of them, uh, to make it interesting for different kind of uh, topics and 
if you have one of those which is not so interesting for you, it won't last that long. So it's just like 15, 20 minutes and you will uh, be happy to hear the another one. So basically, uh, I think, I think uh, we found now a nice way to, to, to hear about a lot more things and uh, also to uh, be attractive for the non-so-technical and also for the technical ones, because if it's becoming technical or more detailed, uh, then of course it's becoming hard to, to follow. And if it's an only technical talk, it's kind of okay, you're attracting only a very small crowd, uh, which is very interesting in that one. I think that can be done in the mingling after, after the meetup. So, uh, without further uh, delaying the, the meetup, uh, we have uh, five presentations. So, in the, uh, in the invitation, you had uh, uh, three of them. So, first one will be Daniel, he will talk about uh, Green. And then we will hear um, from Paul uh, about uh, ICOM, um, another blockchain platform. Then I will talk about Artis, another blockchain platform. <laughs> um, then we will hear uh, from <coughs> Daniel uh, about uh, Crypto All Rounder. So here, and uh, Helmut will uh, talk about uh, Ubik, uh, Unique, sorry, uh, we'll talk about Unique uh, in, as our fifth <coughs> talk today. So uh, please keep it somewhere at 15, 20 minutes, and uh, also if, if too many questions are, uh, just, 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 uh, wait until the end and then you ask the ones who presented for further details. If you already five questions or ten questions, then we are otherwise exceeding and delaying for the last presentation. So we are not exceeding the time, we have still some time for me. So, then let's get started. Daniel, thank you. Uh, thank you, Thomas, for the introduction. And as I heard, there was some only English speaking in the audience. I will try my best to present in, present in English. But if I run out of vocabulary, I switch to German, and yeah, I will try my best. Okay. So, Krim. What is Krim? Oh, just one step. Uh, I'm a developer working with Maxi and Coinfinity. Um, we always try to Keep an, eye, keep an eye on the on some new uh, technology uh, in the blockchain field, and I guess two years ago or something, I stumbled or we, we as a company stumbled over Grin, and we are no experts in it by any means. We followed the topic a bit, and I will try to give you a very quick overview about it. There are really a lot of uh, technical innovations in it which every, every of it itself would take a whole talk, so I, I cannot explain everything. Well, I, you, if you don't know anything about Green, you, you will not completely understand it after my talk, so it's, it's a very broad topic. Okay, to get started. Yeah. First, a little comparison, because every one of you knows Bitcoin, of course. <coughs> Bitcoin started in 2008, we are a small posting from Satoshi at the, at the cryptograph, cryptograph, cryptography mailing list. So he just sent a mail where he announced I'm working on a new electronic cash system that's fully peer to peer with no trusted with no trusted third party. My paper is here. Take it or leave it. He also continued to work on the project and uh, disappeared after several years working on it. And nobody knows who Satoshi is. Mimble Mimble started in a very similar form, but only uh, three years ago, so in 2016, on a Bitcoin uh, IRC chat, someone posted, hey, uh, a friend of mine wrote a paper, it, it's maybe to, of interest to you, it's on this Onion server, so it's a, it was in the e-web, so to say. Mimblewimble.txt, have a look on it. Major player has quit, the chat, uh, has quit the chat and never appeared again on this channel. The paper was written by a Tom Elvis Jedusor, uh, which was only the, so the, the paper was the only appearance of this name, and the initial 
planning and also coding was done by Ignotus Beverell. Uh, and both authors or both uh, developers also disappeared from the project uh, sooner or later. And both names are from the Harry Potter universe. And all, uh, many uh, uh, new words that were used in green are also from the Harry Potter universe. So they are, well, again, pseudonymous uh, developer who really uh, took care about not being tied to the project so that nobody can uh, attack the project by attacking the person behind it. So that's also quite interesting. And I think as a quick overview, uh, Andrew Boelstra, the Boelstra, I don't know how it's pronounced, he's one of the major developers of the Green platform, uh, summarizes quite good. Uh, the document titled Mimble Wimble describes a blockchain with a radical different approach to transaction construction from Bitcoin. It supports non interactive merging, cut through of transaction, and confidential, confidential transactions. Uh, what that is, I will try to explain a bit in the talk, but yeah. Wrong direction. So, just as a glossary or explanation of the meaning of the words, Mimble Wimble is an algorithm. Algorithms that describes how we can use uh, elliptic curve cryptography to build transactions on a blockchain, and these transactions in most cases mean uh, financial transactions, which support non interactive merging, uh, which are confidential, which, mine, which means that nobody except the both uh, participants of the transaction know the amounts that were transferred. And also the initial blockchain download scales with the UTX offset and not with the block count, which I will talk a bit later. And most of the uh, technical details are based on uh, work that was done by Gregory Maxwell, which comes from the Bitcoin universe. So a lot of ideas were born in the Bitcoin blockchain. Green, on the other hand, is an actual implementation of a client that uses technology from MimbleWimble. So MimbleWimble is only the description of it. You cannot buy MimbleWimble coins, but Green is a blockchain that uses the MimbleWimble protocol and you can buy Green coins, so to say. There are also uh, different implementations of the MimbleWimble protocol, like Beam, for example. I just stumbled over Green uh, before, and so I know a bit more about Green. Also, the Beam project is more or less centered around the company that also has an ICO, uh, ICO-like funding and the Grin is more of the open source variant of, of Beam, so to say. <coughs> Just a quick uh, comparison of the technical details. In uh, Bitcoin and Grin, uh, both are UTXO-based, so they track uh, each, up, each transaction generates new outputs on the blockchain and the blockchains track only the state of the outputs. Are they unspent or uh, they spend? If, as long as they are unspent, you can spend them again. If they are not uh, unspent, they can be more or less forgotten. This is in contrast, if, for example, to Ethereum. Ethereum tracks the balance of accounts. Uh, BTC has addresses. Uh, the addresses are the public key hashes, and you can send coins to an address. Green, on the other hand, has no address. So if I want to send green to somebody else, he cannot give me his address, but we have to interactively exchange information to uh, initiate the transfer, transfer of money. It's quite comparable to the uh, initial uh, uh, state how Bitcoin worked, because Satoshi also had Imagine that send, sending to an IP will be the main use, how you use Bitcoin. So the addresses only appeared later in Bitcoin. The total um, token amount in Bitcoin is, for example, 21 million, as we all know, and in Green it's unbound. That's sometimes a critique point uh, of Green, but in my opinion, it's not a that big uh, critique. If you, if you know the uh, inflation scale, it does not, uh, in my opinion, it does not uh, matter that much if it's unbound or bound, but you can plan ahead. You know, for example, in Bitcoin it will approach 21 million, and you know in green that it will grow linearly in comparison to Euro, where I don't know what the total amount is now uh, in one day. <coughs> the average block interval for Bitcoin is 10 minutes, for green it's one minute, it's just a bit of this. 
The block reward is for Bitcoin was 50 Bitcoins in every block in the beginning and it halves every four years and for green it's 60 green in every block and, that's, and that stays constant. So that's the reason it does not uh, converge to a certain amount. The proof of work, that's also a big new, yeah, it's not really new but it's one of the first coins that uses it as far as I know, is for BTC it's SHA-256. And uh, this uh, algorithm, uh, algorithm scales with CPU, uh, CPU power, so you don't need much memory for it and you don't need much storage for it. For green it's a cuckoo cycle, or however it's pronounced, and this uh, proof of work is mostly bound by memory bandwidth. So you need a lot of memory and you need a lot of fast memory, so it should be good mineable with uh, uh, graphics, hardware and comparable and they also try to be ASIC resistant in the beginning but they also have already plans that they with him, that the older the project gets the easier it should get to make ASICs for it so they have uh, uh, algorithms in it where you have <coughs> two different mining properties and the, the one of the ASIC easier uh, algorithm will get even more easier with uh, increasing time yeah. <coughs> okay, so let's get some technical details. <coughs> Everyone that has used Bitcoin or has used a block explorer to see some Bitcoin transaction knows these kind of outputs. This is blockchain.info. If someone sends money, he needs to broadcast a transaction on the network. If the transaction is broadcast, you see a lot of input addresses and a lot of output addresses. For every input address, you see the amount you are spending from the address and you see which amount gets to which address on the other side. So even just looking at the transaction has, you can already know a lot about the entity who sent the address. You know that he has the private keys for all of these addresses, so you know that he owns around eight hundred thousand dollars or something and sends money to these addresses and you can make certain chain analysis, chain analysis and you can say sometimes quite a lot about it, a person if you know some details from him. <coughs> A block gets mined by a miner and the block contains inputs. Here on this level the Bitcoin, a Bitcoin block would contain transactions and the transaction would contain inputs. But here you are already uh, at the inputs level, so you have a <coughs> block where a certain amount of inputs get into a block and a certain amount of outputs get out of the block, so to say. So the outputs are the, again, spendable uh, transactions. Or this outputs, yeah. <laughs> and if you look into one of these, the, the, these are also called commitments. If you look, look into a commitment, you see it has a commitment hash, it has a time span, and it has a proof. But after this level of details, there's <coughs> you don't see anything. So you don't know the amount that was transferred within this transaction. You don't know. <coughs> If the inputs, contain, uh, inputs are owned by one entity or by different entities, and you can't say anything about it. Uh, yeah. How this works on a very, yeah, I try to make it not too technical because I also don't understand the deepest details. <coughs> but. Um, Mimble Mimble describes how you can use uh, the linear properties of a certain signature algorithm. In Bitcoin it is, you have inputs and outputs and you as a owner of the inputs, you need to sign the transaction. You say, okay, I want to use these inputs and send it to these outputs, here is my signature. <coughs> these signatures are because of a certain property of the signature algorithm was not linearly com uh, combinable. So you would need the private key to change the signature or to change the, <coughs> the 
properties they sign. In Mimble Mimble, <coughs> they use a bit of a different signature structure where not the sender, but the sender and the receiver signs uh, the state of the transaction and they also use a linear, uh, <coughs> linear combinable signature where you can combine all the inputs and all the outputs and just linearly add the signature and the signature is true for the whole transaction. So you can take two different transactions, combine them and just add the signatures and the signature is again true for the same transaction even if you don't know what's inside of the transaction and even if you don't know the private keys of the participants. <coughs> so this allows you well, not you, but the miner, for example, if the miner sees a lot of different transactions with 10 signatures for each uh, si uh, transaction, he can just take all the inputs, take all the outputs, add them together, generate one signature for it, and also have a valid signature for the <coughs> data he can include in the block. Which this also means, because uh, all the inputs get added and all the outputs get ended, added, and then because outputs are negative, this Subtract, subtract from one side, here we see that this output gets is an input again for the second transaction, but on the output side it's negative, on the input side it's positive. We can also just forget it. So uh, <coughs> outputs that get spent within the same transaction or within the same block does not even get on the blockchain at all. So that's a, uh, again a privacy and the space saving uh, gain. <coughs> but what is true for one block is also true for the whole blockchain in itself. So here we see multiple blocks where the first block generates an output which gets here used as an input and we have here some outputs that get used as an input. And if I'm <coughs> joining the blockchain later on in Bitcoin, that would mean I need to re-download every transaction since the Genesis block and validate <coughs> everything to know that at the end I'm at the same uh, result as everyone. <coughs> but in the green case, I can download everything pruned, so everything that is not used as an input can, uh, everything that, can, that was used as an input can be left out. I just need every not spent output and every uh, Coinbase input, so that, that, that's the mining reward. And if I add these together, I end up at a valid signature. <coughs> and uh, this means I just, uh, the, the space that I need to download grows just with the existing outputs and not with the length of the history of the whole chain. And again, it's a space saving and anonymity uh, gain because after a certain time, if you don't, I mean, analysis service will index the chain from the beginning and they will, won't drop the information but yeah so you don't need to present the whole chain for every new uh, participant <coughs> also uh, an anonymity gain is they from the start they use Dendelion, Dendelion broadcasting which Bitcoin already got or get within the next version I'm not sure where if you broadcast a tra transaction, it is uh, more or less onion routed through several nodes and only broadcasted at a later node. So all the nodes that take your initial uh, transaction don't know actually anything about the transaction because it's uh, encrypted with multiple layers. And after each step, one layer gets built and only if every encryption layer is built, so to say, then the last node starts to broadcast it. That means that the Broadcasting node is in, in most cases not the originating uh, node, so if I take uh, traces which IP broadcasted which transaction, it doesn't mean anything. <coughs> so, for example, that's just a quick example how sending uh, how building a transaction in Green works. We have a sender, we have a receiver. The sender needs to initi initiate a transaction, but he does not send, say, I want to send to somebody, but he just says, I want to send 10.25 Green, for example. <coughs> this, uh, 
this command then generates a text, uh, a DX file where the uh, the prepared transaction is stored, but it's not signed. You can send this to the receiver. The receiver can say, okay, I want to receive the amount. Then uh, this command generates a response. You just need to somehow send the file back to the sender. And then the sender generates the fully signed transaction without exchanging any address and then can broadcast it. So this is a two-step protocol where both of the parties need to be online. That's the big difference to Bitcoin, where I can just show you my address. I can print out the address on a slip of paper if I want with a QR code, which we don't have anywhere here. And anyone can send to this QR code. So that's not possible in Kring. Both parties need to be online and talking together. This is just an example of how it works in the command line. There is also an HTTP interface where I can say, okay, my wallet will accept any transaction it receives and I can send to an HTTP address. But again, both uh, <coughs> nodes need to be on there. Yeah, so let's write it downside. Uh, okay, now, the first downside is the transactions in Bitcoin are kind of with a not so smart scripting language, where in Ethereum it's a smart scripting language, so to say. <coughs> and in Grin, there is no scripting language at all. So I only have a mathematical, uh, let's say, yeah. yeah, okay. In Bitcoin, if I sign something, or the signature in Bitcoin can mean a lot of things, so that there could be a complicated riddle which I need to sign, which means that I can only spend Bitcoins with him a week or so, or I can send Bitcoins only to this address and stuff like this. <coughs> this is uh, meant by scripted uh, signatures, and these are not existing in uh, Grin because that would be impossible to make on the blockchain because then the linear uh, compactable properties of the signatures would disappear. But there is also <coughs> some uh, implementation or some tech demo where you can uh, implement a lot of the scripts like time locking and uh, the hash locked hash time locked contracts which is needed for, for lightning transaction can be done on the mathematical side of <coughs> the and that's called the scriptless scripts it's quite an interesting youtube video if you're into the, <coughs> that kind of stuff um, yeah, currently both parties of the transaction need to be online, as I first saw you said. Um, transactions, even they are uh, prunable and I can forget a lot of the transaction data. The problem is in green one transaction is a bit, or is a, currently at the factor of five or so, bigger than a Bitcoin transaction. So I can save a lot of the old transactions, but the new transactions are bigger. But even that would mean that uh, I'm, I don't have the actual numbers, the, 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 the recent numbers. <coughs> Bitcoin currently has around 200 gigabyte. And if the same data that is currently used for, or that the same transaction state as in Bitcoin would be used in Green, it would be around uh, 100 gigabyte. And it even uh, is better with, with time, so Bitcoin uh, will grow steeper than yeah, Green. Thing, things like paper wallets and cold storage is not that easy with Grin because of the interactive properties of the transactions. And it, of course, has a lot of new technology, crypto that is not that uh, well known, like the crypto, uh, cryptography that it's used in Bitcoin, so it's not that battle hardened. So there might be some implementation errors, or there might be some, maybe some complete. Uh, bigger problems that were not imagined, and yeah, so invest not that uh, invest carefully <laughs> if you want to invest. The current state, <coughs> the Green Main Chain. So uh, it, the Mibu Mibu protocol was announced in mid of 2016, and at the beginning of 2019, the Green Main Chain got running. So it is already running. You can own Green coins. There are several exchanges where you can buy them, but the current wallets 
like I showed you in the previous slide, are all command line based, or most of them. There are some uh, graphic, graphical user interface already available, but they are both in beta or at best at alpha stage. Um, there is also some workarounds for the interactive properties of the transaction. There's like a green box where you can generate generate a, a green address where someone can send to the green address without you being online. And you can <coughs> fetch the result from the green box. So it's just a uh, buffer, so to say. And, uh, but it's trustless. You don't need to trust them with anything. But yeah. So it's a bit of a in-between thing, like a normal address. Um, in my opinion, it has a very acti active uh, developer community. I have I, I follow the GitHub channel quite closely, and there are a lot of uh, merge requests and issue discussion and whatnot. So they are very active, in my opinion, and they are listed on twenty markets or so. No. <laughs> Yeah, th this picture was posted on Reddit, I guess, on the start of the beginning. I myself would see myself as a Bitcoin maximalist most of the time, but Green really has some nice I ideas. But also, the interesting stuff was, as Green was initial planned, or Mimble Mimble, they were planning to have it either include lots of the stuff into Bitcoin directly, or use it as a... Uh, what's it called? Uh, a side chain of Bitcoin so that it does not have its own uh, crypto economy, but you can lock Bitcoins into it and then use the green or nimble nimble properties. But after several months or years, they noticed that it has quite a lot of complications and they started uh, to make their own blockchain in their self where they have some, uh, yeah, where they need to make the financial value of the coin. So they need to also take care about that. So that's also a complicated, but it's a complete dedicated uh, blockchain for itself. But also a lot of ideas will, in my opinion, flow back into Bitcoin. So with Schnorr signatures, Schnorr signatures, which have a similar properties like the Mimble Mimble signatures, and if these will be available in Bitcoin, then a lot of the stuff that you can do in Mimble Mimble with these kind of things, you can do then later on in Bitcoin also. <coughs> yeah, and that was my very quick introduction into Mimo Mimo and Green. And if you have some questions, you can try to answer, uh, ask them. I will try to answer them as good as possible. <laughs> Are there any quick questions? Otherwise, the next talk. Oh, any icebreaker? Anybody? So I would be interested. What, what, what's the thing that is so attractive to you? So it's the privacy, obviously. So you can do blockchain analysis. Definitely. Yeah, that was, I guess, the first. Well, maybe the first stuff was the, the, the space savings because it was very interesting that you can limit the blockchain down to the. UTXO set in itself and only need to download these data. So I thought that that would scale way better than the current Bitcoin idea, but also it has some downsides because the transactions are quite bigger than in Bitcoin, but that might also be solved in the future. And the privacy is a nice add on, in my opinion. Nice and important. I thought the space savings you also need all coin based transactions, right? Yes. So, so this will grow linearly over time. It, there are also some other small ones that I just jumped over that's called the kernel. Every transaction can, generates a kernel that's only a small, uh, I think, 30 bytes value or something like this. But these currently cannot be pruned. So every transaction will generate a new kernel, and as you said, every block a new coin based transaction. So it will hardly grow linear with age, but also the big stuff of data, like all the transactions between accounts, will get, uh, you can prune. Yeah. So from this perspective, way better. Um, 
but some kind of uh, uh, light nodes or <coughs> light wallets where you don't run a node, is it possible with this technology? Yeah? Uh, currently not, of course, because it's very <coughs> beginning, but there are also some uh, in the document folder there, they have already document different levels of pruning where you have different downsides of where you need to trust certain stuff, but you can um, run. So I, that's the part that I really did not understand, but this Andrew Post has a YouTube talk where he says he can, with only a little downside, he can compress the UTX set into a five megabyte nearly constant uh, proof of blockchain state, and you only need to download these plus a bit overhead for the accounts you have. So you can download the current state. Uh, you can download the proof that is enough for you that you can trust that you own the money that you think you trust with under 10 megabytes, which is quite nice for sm uh, smartphones, uh, for smartphone wallets. Okay, so let's move on. Thank you very much. I'm a blockchain developer at uh, block for You. We are a blockchain solution provider based here in Graz. And tonight's topic is Viken. You will go out and have all the information necessary to make your votes, to make your decisions, and to go into a better future, of course. So what is Viken? It lives under the slogan, hyperconnect the world. Viken is a blockchain itself. And the idea behind ICON is to connect the different blockchains together like back in the days the internet did. So we have, for example, here we have a blockchain for uh, health data, we have here a supply management blockchain and here something uh, with law and maybe there is Bitcoin and Ethereum. And in between all of this there is ICON and it should enable that all blockchain that you could, for example, I don't know, buy with Bitcoin then um, some um, law stuff. It's a little bit abstract, but it's really cool, and they always refer to the idea that uh, back in the days uh, there were many local uh, networks, and then there came the internet, and it connected all the networks together, and we can live this wonderful life that we have today. So what are the parts of the ICON ecosystem? Uh, they call it ICON Census, with the slogan, what spread and disrupt, and there are um, four main parts. The first are the public representatives, and these are the block producers. These are the nodes that can produce and verify blocks, and it doesn't work with uh, proof of uh, work or uh, classical proof of stake. It uh, functions with something where everyone who holds icon can stake their icon, can put their icon to one of these P reps, and then the top 22, the P rep nodes with the most votes can produce blocks. And this is an ongoing process, and this means that this is a very dynamic election process. So that is not one date where everyone can vote, but the whole time the P-reps have to be careful that they do something good for the ecosystem, because uh, I have forgot to mention if you're a P-rep you get the um, transaction fees because you're producing blocks, and that means that you should um, organize events, make some nice DFs, make uh, other great stuff that make the ecosystem thrive. Another program is the DApp Booster program. That means that uh, every one of you could uh, make a decentralized application on ICANN. And then you um, put it to this DApp Booster program. And again, if ICANNists, people who hold the ICANN uh, currency, ICX, vote for you, you get part of the transaction fees, you get part of the funds. And this means you can use this money to further enhance your DApp. The ecosystem expansion project is similar, but this time it's not about the apps, it's more about um, community events, it's more about um, all stuff around it. And the last part is also very interesting, the community representatives or CREPs. Because this is the glue that holds all blockchains together. You can see here, for example, as I said, we have blockchain A, B and C. In the middle there is ICANN. And the CREPs are the portals to these other blockchains. They create transactions from uh, Ethereum transactions so that you, we all can use it in the ICANN network. Now let's come to a little uh, technical aspect. 
the blockchain engine that uh, I can run on is a loop chain. It's developed behind the company behind ICANN. The consensus algorithm is delegated proof of contribution. It's a little bit different than um, delegated proof of stake or just in general proof of stake. It works like this, that you have a lot of coins and if you have a lot of coins and you put them somewhere, how do you say, if you don't move them, then you are allowed to build blocks. And the delegated proof of uh, contribution is that other, you have to get other people to give you their money or to vote for you with their money, let's say. They still keep it, but uh, because they say, hey, I have 100 euro, this guy is awesome, I vote for him. What is also really cool is uh, fee 2.0. They call it fee 2.0 because it should be very new. Today, nowadays, in um, classical um, blockchain platforms, if you want to interact with uh, smart contracts, with decentralized applications, you always need to have some money to pay the transaction fee. But with fee 2.0, it's possible that in the smart contract, there are some ICX. And when you call the smart contract, the ICX pays for you the transaction fee, which means it's far easier to onboard new members, new users who are not that, um, how do you say, blockchain affine. And uh, the last part, I didn't have the right word for it, I call it uh, coin supply management. In Icon it's also very interesting because um, the idea behind is this. We have a very complicated chart, but you only have to look here and here. Here we generate the blocks, and by generating blocks, of course, uh, the block producers get, or there are transaction fees, yes? And now, with these transaction fees, we want to give money to B-Reps, to the expansion program, VM, and so on. And uh, the problem is, now there is a certain amount of money that is needed for all these people because of mathematics, yeah? You get so much, you get so much, but there are not enough transaction fees. So what can you do? We're intelligent, we just mint new ICX out of the air. So for example, if we need, let's say, 100 icons, and we only have 80, we just mint, 20 new icons and we put it here and we have again 100. That of course means that there is inflation, but on the other side, if the network is used a lot, for example, we have here 130 transaction fees, we just burn 30 of the ICX and this is the idea how we can make this ecosystem thrive. I'm really um, curious how this will work because of course if nobody uses it, there will be always inflation. And uh, if everybody uses it, it will be the other way around. But uh, yes, I think it's a really cool concept. So about the coding, if you want to code with it, it's uh, very similar to Ethereum. If you already coded with uh, Solidity, the, uh, we just did it in Python because the engine is written in uh, Python. It's uh, very similar, or there are like decorators like uh, payable and uh, event logs. And also, like for example, in Ethereum, you have ERC20 token standard. Uh, and I think it's IRC2. Yeah, it's uh, all the same methods. Uh, it's, uh, it seems like they want to take uh, already what's good and put it in something new. What is really cool um, is that you can update your smart contracts. You don't have to redeploy them and you have a new contract address, but you can update them and the contract address stays the same so that everybody who already knows uh, your contract still can use it as it is. So, why is ICANN why is ICANN so awesome? Because it connects the different communities. This is a really cool idea, the basic idea of the concept. Oh, they also make uh, good progress in their uh, project development. And for real decentralization, they actually try really hard with all this um, voting, with all these events. And uh, yes, ICANN is awesome. So hey. Why aren't you getting a P-Rep? Where is P-Rep status? Hey! Guess what? We are a P-Rep candidate right now! Woo! <laughs> <laughs> we are right now P-Rep candidate number 14 and mm, top 22 in the ranking are going to be P-Rep. Uh, if you have ICX, of course, uh, you can do it. We were uh, very, how you say, afraid that all the power is decentralized in Asia. That's why we built the ICANN Europe initiative to give European ICANNists a voice. Uh, currently, we have uh, seven members, all, uh, uh, all around uh, Europe. 
and uh, we want to make uh, community events and uh, how you say to support the ICANN ecosystem in Europe. So uh, thank you very much. So far, I'm happy to have some questions. Want to go first? Sorry. Uh, I'm interested in the upgradability of conference. Mm -hmm. Can you update any conflict, or can I, as a user, have any security that the conflict is still that's doing what I'm expecting of the conflict? Yes, I have to be honest. Uh, I still uh, don't uh, know it so much how it works with updating contracts. Mm -hmm. Because if you first write a contract, you get 100% of your funds back, and the next one only 50%. It works really hard. And um, unfortunately, I cannot answer you this. Okay. Uh, it sounds like a bit like Cosmos, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Pocket of, can you explain the differences to these? To Cosmos? Mm -hmm. I don't know Cosmos, I'm sorry. Okay. Do you know other yeah. interconnection layers that you can get with an overview? Um, for the, the, uh, like uh, normal blockchain uh, frameworks, platforms? No, no, like platforms that try to connect between different blockchains, like Cosmos, Polkadot, uh, Interledger, I can trust to do something. Uh, I honestly only know about the interchange from uh, Dragon Chain, okay. which is also about uh, connecting uh, different blockchains. However, uh, my experience with Dragon Chain was not the best. That's why <laughs> I uh, didn't get so much deeper into it. But uh, what do you see the main uh, differences between those two or those uh, three? Do you feel like it's all the same? They always, because when I review uh, blockchain platforms, it's always the same, you know, it's always faster transaction speed, it costs less, it's uh, better usability. Is it here also, like, sounds the same? I, I don't know, to be honest, but I assume, like, I think the governance mechanism is different. Okay, okay. But I'm not qualified to. Okay. Mm. To me, it seems that it tries very much to draw people in from other mm -hmm. systems and not so much to connect them. Like, everybody should be connected to Icon, but I don't see the uh, main draw if I own Bitcoin and I want to pay for something in Ether. Mm -hmm. Why should I use Icon to do this transaction instead of something else? Uh, I think about right now, ICANN is not so much about connecting, it's more about building its own blockchain, I feel like this. Um, and in the end, it's about uh, finding ways to exchange uh, data that is not uh, so easily exchangeable right now. Because if you want to um, exchange Ether for Bitcoin, you go to a decentralized exchange, or a centralized exchange, or you go to see, or I don't know what. And it's uh, far harder, I feel like, to uh, exchange data records um, with uh, cryptocurrency and they want to put like this uh, yeah how to put it like this uh, assets internet of assets that you can exchange everything put everything together and I feel like when I read or when I present this it's um, a little bit uh, abstract you know it uh, feels like a very good but I cannot tell you right now oh, there is this uh, great uh, how you say this is a great ecosystem already existing, you know? Would you uh, compare it rather to Ethereum or rather to uh, such a system like Polkadots or uh, Cosmos? Yeah, unfortunately. 2.0. I don't know Cosmos. And what was the last one? 2.0. E Ethereum 2.0. Uh, I would uh, mostly compare it, uh, yeah. Ethereum right now, but uh, in the um, in the coding style. Mm -hmm. uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, what's the coin economic uh, incentive for running a CREP? Because uh, this, as I understand, are the gateways to other blockchains. Yes, 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 yes. And yeah. and how you uh, prevent the risk from that the value is not transacted correctly from another blockchain because this risk. It, uh, the C C rep would uh, have to act correct so that it, mm, it happens. Or so uh, I didn't see any technical details about this aspect. It should be the 
the main uh, reason for this blockchain exists, huh? That uh, it's uh, verified that C reps are providing the right information. Yeah, but uh, to run a, a C rep, I, as I understand, they must own coins of the other blockchain, and then somehow I help transferring value across different blockchains, and in between is this icon chain. Yeah. Yes. And how is this working? There was no way to do this. Uh, very true. Yeah. It was uh, actually uh, it was not work because uh, I cannot explain it uh, so well and I'm uh, not so deep into um, the technical parts of uh, Zero. Uh, as far as I know, it works like the same as uh, with uh, other um, uh, P-Reps and uh, community nodes that uh, people vote for it and that you have to trust that what they voted for uh, works. So if uh, it occurs that, that they are doing something that is not, how you say, that is malicious, that they are then um, voting for somebody else, and then they are doing it. But actually, I don't know it, and I'm just imagining it right now. Last question. Uh, the big problem with uh, voting government systems in blockchain is always that there are uh, cartels get built and people just vote for each other yes. and not for somebody developing good software for it or something like it's a vision. Yes, 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 uh, yes. Do you have any strategies how to combat that if you want to become a, a P-Rep? Well, in, in, in like cartel-like uh, setups, it's uh, always like that only the, um, the big players are getting the money and here they try to also give back uh, to uh, the um, people who are icon themselves and uh, they try to spread it more than just the uh, uh, say producers, uh, main nodes, but I have to say that it's uh, really not so easy to, um, uh, to, uh, uh, to forbid that and that's uh, why uh, we said, okay, I can do this initiative to spread more because uh, most of the votes are in uh, Asia right now. Uh, yeah. but but if like there's 22 producers, if like 13 of them uh, build a, a cartel and vote for each other, yes. then it doesn't matter if you have a lot of fans or something because they will have more votes than you and most of the users don't care about voting. Yes, that's very true, only 10% of the yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I thought voting is done by, by money, like if yeah, sure. everyone like owns is 10 million and I own 6 million in total, then I can reach that. Most money is lazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but most money Usually is also it's like 10% like of the coin holders of the coins that are hold vote. And that's my worry about voting blockchains, that there's always, after some time, there's a cartel that brings itself up. And what is the incentive for voting? Do they get some power? Yeah, they get some rewards. Yeah. And actually, there are, there are some um, P Web candidates they are doing, right? What would you explain? So the promising to the voters to give back um, some rewards to them, and they are right now ranked in the top three Europe candidates. But uh, I can try to to prevent those those behavior and also to yeah punish so, such behavior that doesn't doesn't happen. Who decide to ban? But 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 why is there a central organization? Who, uh, yeah, yeah. Who, who changed the rules? Uh, right, right now there's the Icon Foundation who's building the, the, the platform, and with the P rep voting, they um, they they going the step towards democratization and they give power not only to the foundation but also to the 22 P reps, and then, and then they do also governance and stuff. Was there already a hard fork in history, so changing of rules? No. no. Okay, thank you.
Okay. Good. So I try to be as, as enthusiastic as Paul just has been. Uh, that, but unfortunately, it's not my natural. So uh, I apologize right before it. So I won't be able to do that kind of uh, uh, talk. But um, and I've put it a little bit more technical, a little bit more more in detail uh, about what I'm going to talk about. Who knows the artist blockchain? Who doesn't know? <laughs> so one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So, a uh, couple of words from history. So, uh, the artist blockchain is uh, the only Austrian blockchain which is uh, basically uh, uh, running, in my opinion. So, well, there might be some other. I don't think that. David is already kind of not sure if there is something else. Um, so, artist is uh, using the Ethereum uh, protocol. Um, and I will tell more about the upcoming Moon Network upgrades uh, towards a very kind of uh, different consensus and, and staking logic what we built into that kind of system. Uh, Artis was started uh, last year in November, 14th of November. Um, it's running since then uh, smoothly. Um, and uh, the upcoming network upgrade uh, is quite an interesting one because it uh, has very much in focus to have it more decentralized, have uh, a possibility to uh, run your own nodes, have also the possibility of staking and so on. So, and that's the major part of, of this deep uh, postal and depos I'm talking about. If you're wondering about the moon uh, in, in the network upgrade, we decided to uh, and you probably know that from other blockchains, they all have kind of railway stations or something, some planets or some, some kind of naming logic. So we said, well, why not taking moons? And the first moon in the solar system is moon. Uh, so therefore it's moon and the next one will be something... Mars. You are good. Also a yeah. You're good in moons, I know. <laughs> So, um, but first, uh, Lab10 Collective, uh, we are a blockchain uh, cooperative. We build sustainable blockchain solutions. We have about 40 members. Uh, quite some are here, so if you ask closely and you're not a member, you will find out that a couple of members are in the group. Uh, we have fully focused on, uh, on the topic of climate change, so basically establishing uh, the artist blockchain as the go-to uh, blockchain for climate action and projects which are connected to uh, climate action. So we are very intensively involved in projects around energy and mobility. So that's basically the application space where we operate uh, as, a, as a company. And the blockchain itself is basically the one we are, uh, we are choosing to do those applications on it. To give you a, a kind of a idea how it works. So basically we are a side chain for uh, Ethereum. So we are not trying to compete with Ethereum. We are trying to uh, have a blockchain which is kind of adding value to the Ethereum decentralized finance uh, blockchain system. So you have the Ethereum blockchain and if you follow that closely, uh, there are a lot of decentralized finance applications establishing on the Ethereum blockchain. So you have landing platforms, you have stable coins and all kinds of stuff happening on the Ethereum blockchain because you can very freely program the smart contracts on it. So uh, it made it kind of viable to do those financial or decentralized financial applications on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, we consider that as a very good base layer to take, for example, a stable coin and move that stable coin via a bridge to the Altis blockchain and use that stable coin on the Altis blockchain, which you can move back to Ethereum and use all the trading markets, the exchanges, what you have there, decentralized ones on chain, and all kind of stuff which is happening on Ethereum. So, an important part here is that we already connected to Ethereum. So, this is not like talking about it. So, there are bridges out there which can be used 
uh, for moving tokens uh, between those chains. So, uh, bridge operation is not something I will talk today. So that's just, just see it as you can move everything between those two chains. So this is interconnected. So they have a couple of uh, numbers which you are probably interested in if you're deeper into blockchains. We run with five seconds block time, so basically it's instant, more or less, when you do a transaction. Um, there are 305 million ATS, approximately. Um, so we have 305 million crypto shillings on the artist blockchain. We have about uh, 2.5 inflation, percent inflation. And uh, there is a sustainability pool which will kick in after one year of operation, which will be filled with another 2.5%. So this sustainability pool is like an inflation filled development pool system. So basically that you have some money that you can spend for further development on the ecosystem, on, uh, on the protocol development and so on. That's governed separately. Um, 10 validators currently, and currently every validator needs 4.5 million ATS stake to run a validator. So basically every validator needs to put 4.5 million ATS into it, that he's able to be part of the group of the validators. So um, as I said, Artis is a Ethereum sidechain. It has currently Parity as a node software and uses the uh, authority round consensus, which is basically every validator gets elected as a leader, he's proposing a block to the rest of them, and the others confirm that he made a correct block. So that's the logic, and then it goes on to the next validator, to the next validator, so round, round robin kind of system. Um, yeah, permission validators and stakes, so I said already 4.5 million ATS stake, and the validators have to be voted in. So the other validators, there is a, a decentralized, but there's a voting mechanism. The other validators have to accept the new validator to be part of the group. So therefore, you can't just say, oh, I want to be a validator. Uh, you have to be voted in. Uh, of course, you can run a node. It's an open system. Basically, you can run your own node. You can propose transactions to the system running your own node and you can have your own blockchain uh, copy and that's all open but producing blocks is not open. So, uh, but I think most would agree that's not a very ideal setup. If you have a permission system, only the ones which are in get the, the others in and if they kick somebody out, it has implications as well. Um, just before I go into the details about the new uh, system we're uh, going to launch, that's basically the ecosystem we're currently working with. So probably not many of those are known, uh, but they are all side chains beside Ethereum. So the, the, the part is, what we believe is that we will see more and more a diversification or specialization towards certain verticals, certain kind of uh, areas what you're looking at. So in our case it's climate, in Luxo's case it's, it's fashion, in Poa's uh, case it's games, and for Ocean it's data management and data trading, data economy. Uh, all those networks run basically a side chain connected with bridges to the Ethereum blockchain. So have all the same logic how you can build up a bigger ecosystem, build up a more scalable ecosystem, and uh, if you're running full on one of the blockchains, you can even launch just another one, basically, and use that other blockchain with the switching technology where you move the assets. So, the Moon Network upgrade. So basically, the post DAO is the validator selection. So who is going to be a validator. That's a smart contract system on the uh, artist blockchain. The DPoS is basically a possibility that everybody can stake, who cannot have, who, who does not have enough ATS 
to run a validator or who does not have the technical skills to run a validator. So either one of those options. And the Honey Badger consensus is a new consensus algorithm and uh, we and, well, a couple of others are very excited about the Honey Badger. It was uh, introduced in 2016 and uh, Honey Badger consensus has basically worked on, on, the protocol has worked on several flaws what you have in, in, in typical consensus algorithms. And uh, one, for example, very nice property for the Honey Badger consensus is that it doesn't have a de defined block time. It just kind of runs as fast as you want it and as the internet allows it to do. So it's a very flexible consensus. So basically, if you run it over Tor network, it will just take a longer time to create the block. If you run it on a fast network, it will just create blocks much, much more fast. So it's fully flexible and doesn't kind of, as usual consensus, like if after a certain time I increase the time until a block is produced and you have this kind of stepwise uh, going up and going down for the block time, Honey Badger is completely flexible on the block time. So you will not see a block time in that system. So what we believe is basically uh, artists will be superior on transaction cost, energy efficiency, resilience and scalability. Uh, scalability in connection with bridges. Resilience, uh, this is what I just said. So basically having a consensus which is very flexible, adjusted to the network properties uh, is quite a nice feature. There are several other features but Due to time reasons, I cannot go into those ones. So we probably do another honey badger uh, kind of meetup. So how does the staking and the logic work? So it has a kind of uh, candidate pool. The candidates they need at least um, seven hundred fifty thousand ATS to become a candidate. And then others can stake on those candidates as well. And for an epoch, for example, a day, uh, a portion of those from those candidates is taken and become validators. So during that epoch, they produce the blocks, and then they produce a random number, and from that random number, basically, the new cohort is selected for becoming the new validator. Um, there is a randomness plus a kind of logic how much stake is on the candidates. So the candidates, uh, let's say 2.5 million is 100% stake. Um, so it's very likely that that one will be voted in, but there is also a kind of uh, like possibility that even if you have a full state node, you're not voted in. So there is some randomness in that fun fun function as well. So you cannot completely rely on uh, that you are always becoming validated if it's fully state. So a couple of numbers. Uh, minimum stake, as already said, 750,000 ATS. Uh, so the node software is running parity plus the contract system in POSTA and DPOS plus the Honey Badger uh, BFT, which is in bulk tolerant consensus. Uh, wallet uh, will likely be MetaMask for kind of moving the stake in and out. Uh, by, uh, uh, of course, if you are working on a, on, a, on a UI, so you can do it on the console as well. Um, Rewards, uh, and there is a minimum reward for the ones who uh, is uh, in the validator set. So basically, if you are a validator, you get the minimum reward of 30%. No matter how much stake is on top of your minimum stake of 750k. Um, and uh, of course, basically per block time, per validator. So basically, 
the reward is split over the time until the block takes and, and basically the number of validators in here because they're all configurable numbers. Uh, yeah, and bad behavior, basically you will be banned and there is a configurable banning period. There is no slashing. So if you're looking for slashing, there is no slashing in the system, but uh, banning uh, can be quite substantial from the time frame that it locks down your stake for that time. So if you're behaving badly. One way you could behave badly is when you don't reveal the random number on purpose towards the end of the block time, uh, towards the end of the epoch, which is needed for selecting the new validators. That's something uh, you have to be able to deliver. If you can't deliver it, you are considered to do it on purpose. And then you are automatically banned from the next, uh, for, for the banning time, and then basically then you can come back and can be with part again as a candidate. Uh, delegators, those are the ones which are kind of staking on the, on the validators. Um, they have a minimum stake. This is rather determined by the maximum delegators, uh, what is uh, possible for the system. So, that, uh, so let's, let's assume that about 580 ATS is a good number. Uh, we have not kind of be definite on this one, but, but basically that's kind of a, a area uh, to be expected. Well, it can be again MetaMask. Uh, reward a maximum of 70% of the reward uh, is kind of split over all the delegators. So basically depending on how much you staked, uh, you will get a fraction of that kind of reward which is distributed. Um, and the actions you can take is basically stake, uh, move the stake between validators and uh, withdraw, basically get your ATS out again. Any question for this one? Because both numbers are kind of maybe it's it's good to have that in front of you. No? Good. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, why is it seventy thirty, which is random? Uh, yeah, it's kind of random. Uh, it is uh, it is um, a suggested number per POA network, which was working on the Postal system, uh, and which will be also used for the X I chain. Uh, XDAI chain is another side chain which is using DAI from Ethereum uh, on, on, on the XDAI chain as a, as a main token. Um, and yeah, well, that was, uh, I think it's a rather first because most of the time there is no minimum stake. So basically, validators in many systems can basically give everything away to the ones which hold for them. Uh, here it is kind of a you are assured that you have a certain minimum amount of stake. And uh, our calculations went in the, into this direction that basically uh, what does a fully staked node get and how it's basically possible to have it economically feasible to run a node. Uh, that's another kind of important measure because otherwise you, if it's not economically feasible to run a node, it, nobody will run a node, right? So, and uh, artist system is, with those numbers you see here, uh, it is more or less, uh, it is still possible to run 100 nodes uh, on an economically feasible round. That's the, that's the calculation. Um, as a delegator, if my candidate behaves badly, do my funds also get locked or what happens to me? No. <laughs> but you earn nothing. If you don't earn, you don't earn. Yeah. So you can you can move them away from the, the banned ones mm -hmm. and move it to one who is still not banned. So for a candidate, it would be the best to only have the min stake and then act as a delegator for himself. Would it make any difference? That uh, uh, that sounds like an interesting option because basically when you're let's say fucking up your own validator yeah. and you get bans, then, uh, then uh, it is a, a good thing to do so. Yeah. But you cannot earn for the same period on another validator because if you move the funds to another validator, uh, you still get nothing in this, in this epoch. You are, uh, 
for earning, it uh, depends on where did you stake at the start oh, of the okay. epoch. Okay. Yeah. So, it's kind so of you, can move it, you can move, move it around, but it doesn't count for the rewards of this epoch. Okay. Yeah. Or is this track? Oh, okay. Yeah. I need to be, okay. Yeah. He, he just yeah. looks where it is at the, the start and mm. pay out. So to, to give you a, 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 a little bit of a kind of impression how this looks like, uh, uh, who knows Block Scout Explorer? <laughs> yeah, some know it. <laughs> so uh, there is not just Etherscan out there, there are other explorers as well. One uh, really cool blockchain explorer, completely open source, is Block Scout. Um, and uh, for the artist chain, we are running our own instance, but on Block Scout. Uh, dot work, I'm not sure. Com. Dot net com? I think it's com. Okay. <laughs> on com you find uh, POA network and a lot of, and of Ethereum, of course, and a lot of test nets there. Uh, and uh, we used the same source, so basically we have a cooperation with POA network. Uh, and, uh, and in the future, the the, the upcoming upgrade for the Block Scout will integrate the whole uh, UI for staking as well. So basically, you go on the Blockchain Explorer, and on the Blockchain Explorer, you can kind of interact together with MetaMask and move basically your funds uh, directly on the, the ones you want to stake to. So, also, the candidate management is also here. Yeah, and the candidate management you see up there, become a candidate and remove my pool, all those kind of interactions on the UI, it will be integrated in the blockchain explorer. And, uh, and therefore the fox is here, so MetaMask will help you to move your coins. So uh, that's, that's the upcoming UI. We're not sure yet if we are having exactly that one, or if we have something different, or if you uh, have to start on the console. Uh, that, will, that will be uh, up to this site, but basically that's the outlook, there it's going. So this is uh, kind of the UI who, who will be available. So, um, a little bit more network parameters, even more numbers. <laughs> so for the ones which, which know, want to know the details. Uh, so we're uh, likely going for 19 validators, uh, which are doing the blocks during the epoch. Uh, the network inflation is one ATS per four seconds. Uh, and as I already said, uh, block time is flexible. Uh, we are going for a one second minimum block time. Uh, that's basically that, the, that the, the validators are not kind of doing it even faster. And uh, 60 seconds as a kind of a heartbeat uh, for the blockchain if basically nothing much happens, that you're not creating just all the time empty blocks uh, with nothing in it, uh, so that every 60 seconds you will get one. But of course, if one transaction comes in, it will be probably immediately uh, put into a block in, in probably a second. In, well, maybe four seconds, whatever. So it, we are expecting it to be super fast. Um, so 100% candidates take 2.5 uh, million, uh, and the sh uh, reward share between validators and delegators will be basically if there's nothing staked on the validator, you, the validator with his kind of 750,000 will get 100% of the reward. Otherwise, it will be uh, proportionally shared with the delegators. Um, and uh, the delegators will get up to 70%. And even if it's overstaked, uh, they will just split those 70% among them. Uh, epoch time, likely one day. Uh, block time already states uh, staking rewards according to our calculation. Basically, if there are just 19, then it's uh, at the 15% uh, uh, per, year. per year. Basically, the return on invest in coins, of course, uh, per year in the 15% in the range, if it goes up to 100 validates in the 2% range. So that's what, what I mean. With somehow economically feasible or uh, in a way to run a validator. Um, and locked ATS, of course the more validators and fully staked validators, the more ATS will be locked. So it's like 47.5 uh, million up to 250 million. So as you have seen on one of the previous slides, so if you have 305 million ATS currently in circulation, then uh, 
quite a big bunch of ATS uh, could be locked if there are 100 validators uh, in that kind of system. Um, so that's just kind of graphically. So basically the staking reward, of course, goes down. Uh, the more validators uh, you have in the system and the locked ATS in the system uh, will definitely go up and uh, shorten the supply of kind of liquid floating around ATS in the system. If you now want to become a validator and you don't have ATS yet, you have now the chance to get some ATS. We're selling 50 packages uh, each 750,000 uh, ATS for 15k uh, euro, which is 2 cents per ATS, uh, basically giving you the option to run the validator uh, on that blockchain. That's my slides. That's now opening up for questions. Got a question about the epoch. You said it's approximately one day. Uh, how, how is it calculated? I guess you are um, calculated with number of blocks, which should be it on the no, network. No, it's time. That's oh, pretty time. Okay. Basically, uh, it's over that time the reward will then be transferred to all the validators, and of course the ones which have been banned, they won't get the reward. For that. And it's configurable at the start of the blockchain, so. Uh, Maybe it's one day, but after testing, if we find out three days is better or 12 hours is better, then it could be this. Well, I, it's, it's likely that X star is starting with one week. So uh, we consider it fairly long, having an epoch time of, of one week, but uh, it's not a set in stone yet if it's one day. And the, could the validators like doing governance in the system and change it? change the epoch time later? Uh, well, it's, it's definitely a hard work if the epoch time is, 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 is changed. So basically, uh, it has to have this kind of acceptance of mm -hmm. the ones which run the nodes to do the hard work. So it is, in my opinion, already a sort of governance because if they are not changing the software, it will not be changed. If you say it's a side chain to Ethereum, what does this exactly mean in this case? Or? Um, it means that, well, it is different than Bitcoin side chain. Uh, uh, here, uh, this kind of expression of a side chain has established that basically you connect it with bridges uh, or with a bridge where you can uh, freely basically move tokens from one chain to the other, from one Ethereum block protocol chain to the other Ethereum protocol chain. Mm -hmm. So you have small contracts deployed on both sides and then uh, um, a set of, uh, of uh, bridge operators basically uh, lock the, the, the coins on one side are locked, or the tokens on one side are locked, and generate it on the other side. And if you move it back, they are burned here and they are released on the other side. So basically, you have a, a bridge operation uh, by uh, moving those tokens into a contract and releasing it by minting it on, on, on the other side. That's the kind of logic. So. Do you mean is this on the URC track here or tokens or is this mm. so if I want to move deeper, do we need to wrap before or uh, no. make it? Of course not. Okay. So uh, you can you can you can set up you can set up um, um, current let's let's put it this way. So the current um, if you look it up on, on, on uh, on GitHub, uh, you have to look for token bridge. Uh, the current one is uh, the 2.0 version. There you have to set up for every token, either kind of either coin or another token, could be a ERC721 as well. Uh, but you have to set up a separate bridge for everyone. But the token bridge 3.0, which is 
already tested and, and uh, working on, uh, is kind of different. So basically, you have just one bridge and you moved everything over that one bridge. And you don't care uh, and you don't have to set up do this bridge setup uh, all the time, which is currently quite, quite, quite a nasty bitch. <laughs> Any more questions? We should move on to the next talk. Yes. Okay, so. Mm -hmm. so this this would be mainly a product presentation. So even if you don't like product presentations, you're not allowed to leave now. <laughs> Just joking. Uh, so let me first introduce myself. I'm Daniel Schweiger. I work here at Infinity as a software developer. And in my free time, I, I'm working at this um, Android app. It's called Crypto Rounder, and it's an all-in-one portfolio solution. So let's get right into it. Uh, what is Crypto Rounder? Um, it's yet another app to track your portfolio. So like um, a portfolio, um, it's not your wallet. So for every, everybody who doesn't know, it's like uh, it builds on top of a wallet. It's not actually a wallet, it's like tracking all your different coins you have um, from different wallets. Um, currently, this app supports around 20 plus um, uh, addresses, so coins. You can enter the coin address there and then it will track the balance. Um, we, the app also supports around 100 plus exchanges. Um, also, if none of the coins is available now with the address, you can also put it in manually. So this is another option and there are almost any coins you can use. Um, the story behind why I was creating this app, uh, the, so I started as a no-coiner no some years ago and then I was a hodler. I was hodling mainly Bitcoin and also Ethereum and then I started using other coins as well. And so I, I call this rebalancer, so I'm a rebalancer now. It's something I, <coughs> I found myself, uh, like a passive trader. So I'm not actively trading, but I also want to use different coins, so a lot of coins and um, match it according to a predefined strategy. So it's more of a self-risk management that I want to do. Um, there is a phrase from um, I don't know, Warren Buffett, I think, he said this, do not put all your eggs in one basket. So I'm doing this also for crypto. I'm not putting everything in Bitcoin as a Bitcoin maximalist. So I'm trying to separate this on different coins. That's why I want to do this. So it's mostly risk management. Um, also, um, another thing that came up when I was developing this app, um, not your keys, not your Bitcoin, which anybody of, uh, which is related to Bitcoin uh, knows of. Um, this is mainly an issue here with the tool because I need, it, because I'm a passive trader, I also need to go to an exchange for trading. And if I have my coins on an exchange, for sure, um, it's not my private key and anybody can hack the exchange, like it happened already several times. So I have to find another strategy how to do this. And for this, I was starting like this I was using Coinfinity Savings Plan. Um, to get from my field money from Euro to cryptocurrency because later on then I wanted to use other coins which are not available and so I used Binance for this. Binance, I think everybody knows of, has a lot of different coins which you can use and there I was um, then using the, uh, the Bitcoin I bought for example from the savings plan from Confinity and traded it to all the other coins I wanted to have in my portfolio. And the bad thing here is everything is on the exchange. And so I also had a hardware wallet, a Ledger Nano S, and I had to transfer then the, re the remaining part um, to the hardware wallet. So it's actually my private key to fix this other issue with not your keys, not your Bitcoin. So the, what are similar apps that I found um, that are working? So similar to my crypto around the app, this Blockfolio, I think everybody who uses actually Blockfolio here. Okay, not so many people. <laughs> I thought that more people are using Blockfolio. Um, I used it also, but I would not compare my app to Blockfolio because Blockfolio is not really um, 
doing allowing this rebalancing. And so, does anybody know about Shrimp EIO? No. Okay. So Shrimp EIO is another tool. It's a web tool, and it was made for mainly I think for rebalancing. So you can uh, rebalance a complete portfolio to a predefined strategy. So you put in like percentage how much. For example, if you want to have 80% in Bitcoin, then you want to have I don't know 10% Ethereum and 10% in other coins, and Shrimp EIO will connect to your exchange and will do this for you automatically, so it will re rebalance this after some time, after some threshold, I'm not sure, but some different strategies. And so Shrimp EIO is good in this area because they also have this white paper of them um, where they have a lot of research about rebalancing and why they think it's better than holding, but I don't know. Uh, so they have some s statistics there, how it works, and also some backtesting what they did with different kinds of strategies and you can look up there so there are more technical information about this I don't have it now but if you're interested you can look at their white paper because it's really good so why crypto around that? <coughs> actually I want to track all my cryptocurrencies live so I didn't want to do it like I think portfolio also allows it now for some coins and exchanges but before it was like this I had to enter all the transactions myself when I did something, when I bought some uh, Bitcoin and so on and I wanted to happen, uh, so I wanted that this happens live if I just put in the address and that's what I would, uh, what CryptoRound is doing then the rebalancing of your portfolio like Shrimp.io with a predefined uh, strategy so you can put in the percentage how much you want to have from which coin and then it uh, allows, allows you to rebalance your portfolio um, I also want to compare my performance with other users so this is something I didn't yet implement but I want to have it so you can com for example you can compare with other users of this app um, how their portfolio is looking so not their actual amount like what they have and so on but just the strategy they're using and you can use the same strategy then for your portfolio <coughs> maybe it fits you better then um, I also want to track the transaction history. This is also not implemented yet. I don't know why the wire is moving there. <laughs> Happened somehow. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, the transaction history mainly because of tax report reasons, because that's the biggest issue in this case if you do rebalancing, because you have to also um, uh, make this tax report. So. This is why I want to have some transaction history where which I can export somehow. And also I want to have a transfer from exchange, uh, some from my exchange coins to the other wallet periodically. So I, for example, some percentage I want to have on, on my exchange for trading to rebalance and the rest I want to have on my other wallet because this is where my coins are safe. So that's this point and it should be easy to use so everybody, everybody can use it. How it works behind, so I'm not going too much into details, but um, mainly for the price and for the different coins, I'm using CoinGecko because so at the moment I'm using CoinGecko, maybe I change this later on or I use another one, but CoinGecko has a lot of different coins at the moment and also all the prices for all coins and so it's really good to use. They have an API which I'm accessing from the app and also I'm using for the exchanges, for this 100 plus exchanges, I'm using CCXT, who knows about CCXT? Um, so this is actually an API interface, so you can run it, so this specifically is a REST version of it, you can run it on your local computer for example and it will give you access um, to the all different exchanges, so one unique uh, API interface for a lot of exchanges. This is what I'm using then from the app, so the app itself is not doing this, it needs to connect in the background um, to some server, some CCXT uh, REST server. So either you can in, uh, install it locally for you, if you're afraid of privacy, or you can use then maybe later on some um, server that I'm running. So I'm not sure about this yet. Um, then for all the other balances of the different um, blockchain, I'm using the block explorers, so the API access to all of the different points. And I'm supporting currently like 20. So 
if there are some troubles with some explorers currently, it's bad because I only have one um, API explorer per coin. But maybe I have some false tolerant uh, system later on. So that's how it's working currently. For the team, I, I only have now some screenshots of the Android app. Um, so this is the first thing, it's the overview, the portfolio overview, uh, where you have some nice um, some chart where you can see the balance, how it changed over like 30 days <coughs> and also in percent. Underneath also the total balance of all your wallets you have uh, combined in this first overview. So easy to read, um, you see the complete balance of all uh, wallets and exchanges together. Then if you click on this button, go to portfolio, you get to this uh, second screenshot um, where you can see the different uh, wallets. So you can swipe through, there are some dots, you can swipe through different wallets and add new wallets there. And per wallet you can then add coins which you want to have, like for example we have here Bitcoin, Monero and from the topic before from Green. Um, so you can add Green there, but currently Green you can only add uh, manually because of this, there's no, not really an address in green, like Dan already said, and so on. So this is only uh, manually added there with the amount. Um, then, sorry. Uh, then I have these options uh, on this overview of all the wallets, um, where you can select to add new the manual coin. So if you have a, a coin that where you just want to put in the amount which is not yet implemented by this app, you can use this function here. It will go to CoinGecko and load all the coins. So there are, I would say, almost all coins there. Um, and you can add them with the amount. Then I have this add wallet address, which allows you then uh, to add the, so the, you can enter like a Bitcoin address, Ethereum address, or any other address. and then it will track it via the block explorer so the amount and it will show up in the list there and also you can add or modify an exchange so if you want for example I use um, Binance then you add the Binance API key and secret but it will show you this later in, on another slide <coughs> so this is the wallet address where you put in uh, the coin address or for Bitcoin it works also with XPubs but this is also some privacy thing. If you don't want to enter your XPUB, then you should not do it. And it will send it to the Block Explorer. Um, then on the second thing, you can see uh, all the coins that I'm currently supporting. Uh, there are more underneath, so you, you actually cannot see all, <laughs> only part of them. And <coughs> this is the, uh, the exchange module where you have the API key and secret. You can either put them in uh, there manually, which is not recommended because of some type or whatever. I don't know if there's some checksum, or I guess not. And so I would recommend you to scan it via the QR code and then you don't have to type it in manually. And another thing is I have this overview of the portfolio allocation. So this was the second button. Um, where you can see a nice like some pie chart um, with all the coins you have and the allocation in percent how much you have of each coin and also in the list view underneath so there's also another coin underneath but you have to scroll through the list there and then it allows you to rebalance the portfolio so to your strategy because you can also define the strategy in percent for any coin you want to have and and this is uh, some additional um, options I want to add, like this manual trade that you can trade manually on the exchange via the app. And also this uh, thing with transferring your coins to the wallet, so from the, uh, the coins of the exchange to the wallet. So this would be the second button there. And the last button is the transaction history for the tax report reasons or for any other things what you want to do. And you can use this button as well for this. So where, where can you find this app? Um, currently it's not released yet, so I'm working on it. Um, those are just some demo um, pictures of it. It's an early access, so you can look on the website. It's called CryptoRounder.com. Um, there I'm also describing this application a little more. I also have a video, but it's a little old already, so I have to update this. 
and you can sign up there with your email address and then I will contact you whenever I release the app so you will be one of the first to get access for it. I'm also on different platforms, social media platforms like Twitter, Instagram, YouTube and so on so you can check it out also there. So that was it from the presentation. If you have any questions, it's possible now. The rebalancing you can do in the app, so if you click on the button, it will then use the CCXT um, uh, REST API, the access, and then it will try to check you know, um, how much of which coins you have currently, and it will also check with the, um, with the balance you have in your other wallets, which you included in the app, and then it will check out on, on the uh, predefined figure back. So you can define here, this is the percent, the second last column there. Uh, you can define uh, yourself how much you want to have from each coin currently and it will um, then trade accordingly so it, you have the same amount again, the same percentage. Within one exchange? With one exchange currently. So yeah. not with your cold storage or something like that? With codes, you cannot access the cold storage. Yeah, on yeah, the ledger, like you said. Yeah, you you enter your ledger there also in the um, in the different wallets, and it will combine all of them and check then on the complete portfolio mm -hmm. the percentage, and then it will trade accordingly. So if it sees like uh, you have like eighty five percent of Bitcoin currently, and your strategy is like eighty percent, then it will try to trade five Bitcoin against something else. So it um, tries to rebalance this again. Will it will inform you if you have not enough balance on the exchange? Uh, currently, I don't have these things implemented yet, but I have to also include some system like this, also like some notifications when to uh, when some rebalancing will happen and so on, that you can also check yourself if it's correct or something like this. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about this, but currently I'm not having like some four tolerance system, so it's just like the happy case at the moment. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Go first. Okay. Uh, when calculating the rebalancing, will it be available? Uh, will it be will it be aware of uh, how long have you held on to a certain coin? So, uh, for tax reasons, it might be uh, better to I don't know rebalance that stack versus that stack because if I understand it correctly, you will uh, it will be aware of what's where and in which addresses. Yep. Right? <clears throat> but this I don't know if this even is possible to implement because. Then you need to access, for example, if you have it on your ledger, you need to somehow get the ledger balance then to trade, and I can only trade with the coins you have on your exchange. So, so that somehow still you need to move the uh, funds from your ledger first to the exchange, and that's not possible from the app itself because that's what you have to do with your private key. Right, but it could suggest that you do so. Yeah, it could suggest that, so it's not yet implemented, something like this, but it would be an option to suggest this as well. Yeah. It's also not needed in Austria, because you can do, uh, you can choose uh, which coins you spend, but it that, mm, is not required to be the, really the, the, ah, same, the, itself. the same transaction. Yeah? Mm -hmm. like you can choose, uh, for tax reasons, it's this, uh, this amount that you buy one year ago, uh, but uh, in fact, uh, regarding Bitcoin technology and unspent transaction, you yep. have to take a newer one. Yeah? So you can even take the coins you have on the exchange that you did buy like five hours ago. Mm -hmm. if, if you have some, some Bitcoin balance that is old enough, you can for tax reasons say it's these coins I did trade here. Yeah. So at least I could notify some other user if there's something like this possible. Mm -hmm. That's also what I would have asked if do you do lot tracking? Like, do you track, okay, I bought one Bitcoin two years ago and I bought one one hour ago? Uh, currently not. So currently I it just take the total to balance. That's currently how it's working. But it, if I have the transaction history, I could also implement something like this. But this would be much more effort. Mm -hmm. So currently it's just 
checking uh, how much you have totally of this coin and then you can use it to uh, rebuild. Uh, you do the portfolio allocation based on dollar value? On, on which one? Dollar value? Or you uh, currently on dollar, Bitcoin? Yeah. Currently I'm doing this on dollar. So but I is it a plan that I can, for example, if I say I want it Bitcoin based and yeah. I want to I mean, in Bitcoin uh, 80% of my portfolio of sure. Bitcoin value and not in dollar value? Yeah, sure, sure it would be possible, but that's another implementation that needs, be, needs to be done. Currently it's only based on dollar, so that's what I used. As far as I know, the CoinGecko API is daily prices, right? Mm -hmm. Is this good enough? I don't know exactly. Or daily how average prices even? I don't know exactly. I'm not sure if they have a price, price, price at the moment. Mm -hmm. No. I mean, I mean for right, right for now, right, it's a request right, right now, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Am uh, I correct? Uh, it, it's actually taking the, yeah, actually it's taking the, the balance of your uh, wallet. Yeah. And then it goes to CoinGecko and checks how much is currently the, for example, if you have no Bitcoin, it's checking how much is Bitcoin worth, mm -hmm. current value. So I guess it's I don't know how. At the moment. It's it's a, yeah, I guess it's, it's the at the moment, and then it will take this value. Yeah, but you show the curve over the past thirty days, right? Yeah, this is uh, the overview. So on the overview, we can see. So the, the historic the, prices are also just daily. The historic prices are daily currently, yeah. Okay. That's I, I don't know if they have like minute prices or something, but I just know that they have dailies, daily prices, so I'm currently only doing this with daily prices. So just for visibility for the user. Yeah. Last question. <laughs> <laughs> From my list. <laughs> <laughs> So I want to send euros to the exchange, not Bitcoin. Cur currently, in to uh, you mean to exchanges? But how, how do you want to do this then from the euros? CSD two directive would allow you to register as. Mm -hmm. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. <Okay. laughs> I didn't follow about it yet. Okay. Maybe. You can pump out with someone. Yeah. Have this part. Okay. Okay. That, that was the last question. This last question. It's a one word. What's the incentive for you creating this app? Well, is there some business plan behind what you're going to so, learn from it? So the, so the, the first thing why I started, I already said, is because I was looking for some tool like this to combine all, this, all these things and the thing that was closest to this was the Shrimp.io but it still doesn't do all these things I was mentioning so I was doing then my own thing and creating this app and the incentive is so mainly because I wanted to have this tool for myself mm -hmm. and maybe then I can make some something out of this if other people like this and want to join then it makes sense to also go further but mainly I was doing it for myself first mm -hmm. So if you plan to open source it or is it? I'm not sure yet, so I didn't define this yet. Currently, I'm still developing on it, so not all the functionalities are yet working. So, so it means I have to trust you that you didn't send the API key in secret just to that, the server. That's that's why you can enter your IP address, so you can run yourself CCXT server locally, and then you I can use that. Yeah, but but you still, okay. yeah, for sure, still, still, still it has some option where you can somehow go around or something, but. That, that's uh, an option I'm giving you that you can access also your own local running CCXT server and on, you have any way to trust also the different block explorers with their current balance and so on if this is correct but that's why I want to have like for tolerant system like having different kind of uh, block explorers to use but as long as this software is QS2, even if the software allow me to use my own server, I cannot be sure that inside the software it's some special condition, not some other yeah. service used. Yeah. So open source would be very important for yeah. being for security reasons and so on. So you have to be careful when you write your program right now, otherwise you have all this kind of, I need to make it ready for doing it open source. Yeah. I mean, I'll just see my code. So. Yeah. Basically, writing 
that kind of clean code for example. Yeah, yeah. So this is what I'm currently working on, but I didn't thought about this yet. Yeah. So it's already quite late, so that we are not getting too far ahead. I just asked Helmut that uh, we will have his talk next time. Uh, oh, and maybe in January, because in February I'm in New York talking about the same topic, and so it would be good training. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway, so whenever you are ready, uh, you, can, you can give your talk. So if somebody else uh, now uh, uh, wants to uh, present his uh, or her project, um, and uh, for the next time, just tell me. So we will uh, put into the invitation next time. So uh, please uh, say thank you to Coinfinity for having us here and spending all, all that beer on us. <laughs> Enjoyed uh, the evening and uh, and uh, can stay a little longer for mingling and asking questions or uh, just talking about silly things. So whatever you are up to, uh, I hope you have a nice evening and uh, enjoy the rest of it. Thank you. Thank you.